currently in this sanctuary. And yesterday I had the great honor of introducing uh, Brother Rusty Thomas as he brought the word yesterday at Planned Parenthood. And today I have just as great an honor to introduce my brother John Jacob as he preaches the word. So John, why don't you come up here right now? John and I have known each other for about three, three and a half years or so, and uh, we've spent many, many hours on the streets, hitting the pavement with the gospel of Jesus Christ at many different locations, abortion clinics, state house, monument circle, just preaching the gospel. And we've been persecuted many times together as we've done so. And when that happens, when you're persecuted with a fellow believer, it really yokes you and unites you together. It is a good thing to suffer reproach for Jesus Christ. Let us not forget that. Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sakes. So I would like to attest to the character of this man, John. Uh, he's a godly man. He has a godly wife. And I have observed his life again for the last three years, and he, he's the real deal. And God has raised up John and Angie in this time in their life right now to run, as Pastor Cam said, for state representative for the state of Indiana. And he lives in District 93, which happens to be South Indianapolis and uh, Northwestern Greenwood area. So probably about 45 minutes or so from here. So please keep him in prayer. He ran as his number one platform to end abortion in the state of Indiana. Not regulate the practice, but seek to completely abolish it. He also has other platform claims he's running on, but we're not going to get into all that. But the point is, keep him in prayer. Now, before he begins, sorry, before he begins to bring the word today, I want to read his short uh, testimony that he submitted to Cam and I. It says, John Jacob, he's a lifelong resident of the south side of Indianapolis. Now, John was raised Roman Catholic, and Jesus saved John when he was 24 Years old, over 30 years ago. You're not that old, are you? No, I am. Okay, fine. just doing the math. You don't look it, brother. Thank you don't you, brother. brother. He's an open-air preacher. He and his wife, Angie, have been doing street evangelism for over 13 years. They are both abortion abolitionists and have been involved in a variety of other ministries over the years. John and his wife have been married for over six years. I'm sorry, 11 years, they have six grown children between them and four grandchildren. So please welcome my brother, John Jacob. Love you, man. Love you, brother. Thank you. Right. Can you hear me okay? Is that working okay? Up, up, what's that? Um, you move the, the mic more? Okay, all right. Sorry, I had to grab my coffee. So, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to preach here today. Um, I want to open us in a word of prayer, though, before I start, please. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to come here to preach the gospel, to preach your word, Father. I pray, Father God, that you would fill my mouth with your words, not my own. Lord, that as I, I speak forth your word, Lord, that I'd speak it forth in truth, that you would give open hearts and attentive ears, Lord, to, to encourage we're necessary to exhort, we're necessary to rebuke, we're necessary. Lord, you know what that is. I just pray that you'd help me to faithfully bring forth your word, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for the grace that you've given us in Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Brian, Brother Brian, he shared a little bit of my testimony. Um, the first time I met Pastor Cameron was at the abortion clinic. And I know Pastor Cam doesn't want me to probably share this, but uh, 
for the last about 25 years, I've, I've done street ministry off and on and consistently for almost the last 14 years. And when Pastor Cam came out, he, he told me, he said, you know, he goes, I'm, Pastor Cameron said, I'm used to sitting behind a pulpit. You remember that? And he goes, I, he goes I'm used to preaching behind a pulpit. And I told him, I said, he goes, but he said, being out at the abortion clinic, do you want to use this or use the mic? It doesn't matter. I can, I can use that. That's fine. Okay. You want me to go ahead and shut the other one off? Is that, is that better or no? Okay. Um, you want me to keep the other one on? Okay. So, anyway, Pastor Cam was, was telling me that, you know, being behind a pulpit was comfortable for him. And, and, and for me, being out on the street and actually sharing the gospel out on the street was comfortable for me. I mean, although I was nervous, that's a comfortable place for me. So, I'm just telling you, just uh, uh, as this brother here was, was, was leading in worship, and he was talking about the song that he had just learned, uh, this is a nervous place for me to be, is behind a pulpit. I, it's, it's more comfortable for me to be out on the street. My main text this morning is going to be out of Mark 16, 15. A text that I'm sure is very familiar to all of us. And also out of Matthew 28, verse 17 through 20. Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And then Matthew 28, verse 17 through 20. And by the way, I'm going back to verse 17 because I think there's something very key here that I want to plumb out. We're very used to the Great Commission and, and the Great Commission being talked about in verse 18 through 20, but I want to go back to verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus said to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Jesus is the one who said that. In, in Mark 16, it says, he said to them. And I know that seems, some of those things seem trivial, but they're not. Jesus said it. A lot of times on the street, people say, what gives you the authority to do what you're doing? I get that over, over the years. I have got that over and over and over. And I think that's a valid question. What's your authority? I ask people that all the time. They say, well, I don't, if I tell them something from the Bible, they say, well, I don't believe that. It's like, okay, but why do you believe what you believe? What's your authority for what you're saying? You know, my authority is that the God of all creation, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, has commissioned me, has commissioned each one of us, if we are, are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're born again, God has commissioned every one of us to be an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said to go. He didn't say wait. And he said something very key, to go where? Into to all the world. And then he gave us a task with that. And that was, is that we are to preach the gospel. To who? To every creature. Every human being. Every, everybody is to hear the gospel. I'm going to break Mark 16, 15 down. I think just piece by piece is, is where I'm going to go with this. Jesus said 
to go. Authority. We, 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 we drove here today. We saw speed limit signs, stop signs. There are laws. I think most people try to be a law abiding. But there's an authority behind those road signs. There's a greater authority. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to go. And many times, I, 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 this is meant to be a, an encouragement, uh, an exhortation to each of us as believers. Over and over I get from people. And, 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 and by the way, I'm going to take some detours here along the way. I'm not a, uh, a five-point uh, type of person when I preach. So I, 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 I take how I street preach and I, and I, and I bring it to here. When we go, we go in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to be fearful. We're not going in our own authority. We're going in his authority. And with that, we can have all the boldness in the world. But the thing is, what I find over the years, many Christians have asked me, what gives you the boldness to share the gospel with people? And I'm not just talking about street preaching. I'm talking about contact, what I call contact evangelism. I'm talking about when you go to the gas station, when you go to the grocery store, when you're out talking to your neighbor, when you're just talking to a friend or a family member. How do you open up conversations to talk with people? And many times people will ask me, how do you do that? I, I think that's something that we, it's learned. There's, we, we learn to ride a bike. You know, we, we learn to drive a car. There's many things that we've done in our whole lifetime that we learn. But many times I find with Christians that, that, that we as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, we think, okay, well, I'm just going to magically wake up one day and I'm going to be able to share the gospel with people and it's going to become so fluid. And, it's, and, and I tell people all the time, when I, when I do a, a, a job, when I'm doing a, working on the house, I get my tool belt, I get my toolbox, I load up my tool belt. When it comes to evangelism, that's how I look at evangelism. I look at evangelism as a tool belt. It's something where I am doing everything I can to load everything into my tool belt to equip myself to be able to share the gospel with people. Jesus told me to go. He told each one of us to go. Now, the question that people ask is, is well, where do I go? I mean, I think people, Christians, make, we, we make it too mysterious as far as, well, do I share the gospel with this person or not? Lord, do you want me to share the gospel? This person's in front of me. Do I share the gospel with them? Well, I just take the passage for what it says. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Another verse I like is Proverbs 16.9. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Every day, you guys made a decision today to get up out of bed, get ready, and come to church, to fellowship, to worship the Lord, and to hear the word being preached. We don't make a lot of the things that we do on a regular basis very mysterious. We just do them because there are things that are in our schedule. Maybe it's going to the grocery store. Maybe it's coming to church because, you know, the, the Bible talks about not forsaking the assembling together of our own. And all I'm trying to say is, is this passage gives us that framework. I find that, that Christians take the framework of Mark 16, 15 being this, and they want to restrict it down to this. And I say the vast majority, I am talking a huge contingency of Christians. We, we, we struggle with, do I share the gospel with this person in front of me? Are they, are they a human being? Do they know the gospel? Have they heard the gospel? I don't know. There are many times people that, and, and, and I, don't, I don't sweat whether or not somebody has, has heard the gospel once, ten times, a hundred times. Because think about it in your own mind. I heard the gospel many, many times before I responded to the gospel. But it was through the repetition of hearing the gospel being preached at church. And for the first time, hearing the gospel for myself at the age of 23, going to 12 years of Catholic school, I never heard the gospel. Growing up in a large Roman Catholic family, in a large Roman Catholic culture, I never heard the gospel. Being around 
other Christians, I never heard the gospel. That should be an indictment on the church at large in America. I know so many people that, that live in Christian America, and yet they've never heard the gospel. Again, I, I spent the better part of my first half of my life, I never heard the gospel one time. And until the age of 23, when I heard it, first heard it, and I realized, this is good news. Because what I was raised with in, the, in Roman Catholicism was not good news. And I knew that at a very early age, that was not good news. Ceremonies, rituals, good works, I thought, mm -mm. I, I, I knew very early on that that was not going to get me there. I didn't know theolo anything the theologically. The first time I really started thinking about how do I know God at the age of seven years old, I knew at least enough to know that this was not making sense. And I asked my mother, how do you know God? She didn't know. I went to go read my Bible. I started in Genesis. I thought, well, you, you want to know God? I thought you read the Bible. So you open up Genesis. So I, I started reading through the first five chapters. Started reading Genesis 1, got to chapter 5. I said, God, this doesn't make any sense. And I, and I took my Bible, and I closed it up, and I'm bringing my, more of my testimony in here because this, my testimony right now has a lot to do with Mark 16, 15. I closed my Bible up at about the age of 7 or 8 years old. I said, God, I said, you're not anybody I can know. I wasn't mad. I wasn't angry. It was just very matter of fact because I didn't have anybody around me that could preach, that, 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 could tell me how I could know God. And so from the age of about seven or eight years old, my life really honestly started going way downhill from that. And that I can pivot back and look at that point in my life, and things really, really started to get bad from there on. And from the age of seven to 23, that's how I lived. I lived like there was no God. And it wasn't until the age of 23 until my coworker, who was a born-again Christian, boldly shared the gospel with me, repetitively. And he finally gave me a New Testament. He said, here, read it. And then I opened it up and I started reading it. And boy, it wasn't anything like when I was reading back when I was seven or eight years old. It was, it was like the Lord was speaking to me. That, there was a difference then. And it was over the course of about a year after hearing the gospel and reading the word, it finally made sense. I thought, wow, salvation really is a free gift. Because it took a lot of unlearning in my mind and, and all I'm saying is, is that too often we can run across people in our own lives and we can say, well, they probably heard the gospel or they grew up in a Christian home or I know I've already shared the gospel with this person or I know they know the truth. I mean, fill, fill in the blank. I've heard those from, from other Christians. But brothers and sisters, God has called us to go not to just to periodically preach the gospel. We are to preach the gospel on a regular basis. And when I say the gospel, I am talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as laid out in 1 Corinthians 15. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. It is through that Sacrificial death that Jesus provided for us on the cross, and he offers to, that to us freely. And, and I'm, I'm being very clear about this because there are a lot of other gospels. Because the gospel I was raised with was the Roman Catholic gospel. The Mormons are raised with a Mormon gospel. Jehovah's Witnesses have another gospel. Muslims, Buddhists. Everybody has an idea of how they get to God. God. Man has been trying to get to God, or at least trying to say he's getting to God. Look at Adam and Eve in the garden. Man sinned, he fell, he took fig leaves to, sh to cover himself up. Really, that's what religion is. That, that is what religion is. is man's attempt to cover up what we've undone and broken. We've broken the relationship between us and God. We could not fix it ourselves. That's why Jesus came. And Jesus used words. Jesus didn't sit up in heaven and say, and preach the gospel down to us on earth. He came, he was born of a virgin, 
He came and become one of us. He lived a sinless, perfect life. And then he willingly went to the cross as a perfect substitute for each and every one of us. And to answer the question, did Jesus really preach the gospel? Yes, Jesus did preach the gospel. So many times I, I get, I, I run across again Christians, and, I, and maybe this sounds like an indictment, I guess maybe it, it is, and so it, it, that's the one side, but I want, it's, a, it's a challenge to us as believers on the other side. So many times I get from Christians, well, I'm going to wait until somebody opens up the conversation. God has not given us that that freedom. He said for us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus told his disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. My dad loved to fish. And he he infused that love for fishing to each and every one of us, me and my three brothers and my mother. And so when we went to go fishing, my dad would get the boat out. He would prepare the boat. He, in the middle of winter, he would be getting his fishing box out, and he would be getting his fishing pole and putting new line on his fishing pole and getting his lures ready. He would be preparing everything. When we were actually go out fishing, we would get the boat out. We would, there would be all these preparations, getting our permit and everything that we would do before we went fishing. We would take all that stuff, and we would go to the lake. We would drive out to the spot, and these spot, the spots where we knew where we could catch the fish. We would take the, the fishing pole, and we would cast it into the water, and we would play the line. And I'm belaboring all that to say that that is how fishing for men is. It's not us waiting till somebody says, man, I just see Jesus in your eyes. Will you tell me what makes you different? <laughs> really, I mean, how many of you had somebody have said that to you and used that as an opportunity to open up the gospel? Please raise your hand. I think I've had maybe one or two people say that to me over the last 30 years. You know, the vast majority of time is, is that I, I went ahead, I make, I, I, I create the opportunity. It's just like fishing. You, you, you go to where the fish are at. I never sat in my yard, got my fishing pole out, and threw it into my yard. I didn't take my fishing pole and throw it out on the street. I went out to the lake, went where the fish are at. We need to go where, I noticed, I'm I'm really pleased here. Looks like you guys have an evangelistic event here you were talking about. Yeah, I was talking to my wife. I would like to, if, if our schedule is open, I would like to try to come. So, but again, the idea is, is that we have to go. We have to initiate the conversation, brothers and sisters. I had a brother I went to church with, and he was about my age. He, he was not very active in sharing the gospel. His daughter was, though. And over, her name was Bonnie. And every, over and over and over, people would say, Bonnie, how do you get so many opportunities to share the gospel? And she had one word. She said, availability. She said, availability. She goes, I, when I go to the grocery store, when I go to the gas station, I don't have the agenda of my schedule. If Jesus is Lord of our life, he's Lord of our schedule. My wife and I, sorry. My wife says I use my hands too much when I talk. I try not to. So, Anyway. My wife and I have an unspoken rule in our home. I try, and we both try to be respectful of one another when we have to be somewhere. But for the most part, if we know we're running late, most of the time we know that there's something has come up. And the something that has come up is is that there's an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. And the last thing in the world we're going to do is we're going to stem off the schedule to cut off the conversation with that person who needs to hear the gospel. Because unless there's something that's almost virtually life or death, emergency, or, or if it's something that's really critical in our schedule, I try to wrap the conversation as much as I can. Same thing with my wife. Do we see things the way that Jesus did? Jesus had compassion on us. God, the Father, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they had 
compassion on us. They offered the way of salvation. They made the way for us. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus came here because he knew that we, God knew that we could not reconcile ourselves to God. So he came here to provide the way for us, and he is that way. His death, burial, and resurrection, faith in that is what brings us salvation. But people need to hear that. And too often, brothers and sisters, so many of us think, other people have heard the gospel. And we don't need to share. And I think the biggest thing that I hear from other believers is, is the issue of fear. I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'll say the wrong thing. I'm afraid I won't make it clear. I'm afraid that I, I won't really know what to say. I'm afraid this person is going to look at me as a fool. They're going to look at me as a religious zealot. I'm afraid maybe they might beat me up. I'm afraid they may uh, kill me. I mean, uh, while I'm still standing here, I've, I've preached the gospel to probably tens of thousands of people. I, I, I don't know. I mean, but I, I'm still alive. And, and you know what? I mean, the, what's the old saying? That really every one of us is immortal until God has us to come home. He has a time appointed for us that we will go home. And nothing will thwart that. When that day comes, none of us will be able to thwart that day. And, and, and until that time comes, we're just to be about the Father's business. Because that's what Jesus was doing. He was about the Father's business. And it was to seek and save that which was lost. Do we see things the way that Jesus did? You know, I think the biggest thing about evangelism is, is that many times people look at evangelism as a program. Jesus didn't look at evangelism as a program. He looked at it as people, me and you. People that who were lost in their sin, headed not for a, just a Christless eternity. They're headed for a Christless eternity in the lake of fire, suffering there forever and ever and ever and ever and ever with no escape. When they've been there, not that there's any probably concept of time in, in eternity, when they've been there a trillion years, they will just have begun to be there. There will be no hope of escape for those people. But yet, every single one of us has the opportunity while we're on this side of eternity, we have an incredible privilege and responsibility to be an emissary, to be an ambassador for the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Personally, it should, we should consider that a high privilege for every one of us, that we are ambassadors of heaven. Think of that. We are, I mean, you think, we, think of, we think of representatives. We think of, we think of senators and congressmen, and we think of the president. But we are ambassadors for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Do we really, really grasp that? And he has commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. He's given us his authority. He said, all authority has been given to me. Brother, I love that song, that last song. I, I love that. I love that song. He will hold me fast. Because I find for myself, I tend to be, I can be very doubtful. I can be very fearful. I get afraid. People I think, okay, well, you open air preach, you street preach. You don't get afraid. I get I'm afraid all the time. People ask, well, when does the fear go away? Never. It doesn't. But, but God helps me when I step out. Peter took a step out on the water, and then he took another step. That first step was probably very unnerving as he stepped out of the boat. I've never seen anybody walk on water. So I'm sure for Peter that that first step was very unnerving. And then he started getting, but he started walking on water. Wow. Jesus, by faith, he was walking on water. But then all of a sudden he saw the waves, and he started sinking. He became doubtful, and he started getting afraid. And brothers and sisters, I know that's, that, that's the way it is for all of us. We are frail. We are dust, and this is a daily issue. Again, I, I'm, I'm probably, I hope I'm keeping on track here, but this, the issue of evangelism is not a program. It is a person. It is a person of Jesus Christ. The first and foremost place I would 
I would challenge people is, is to make sure, number one, when I talk to somebody, I want, I, a believer, you know, are you really born again? And I'm, not to question somebody's salvation. If you're born again, are you cultivating your relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you spending time in your prayer closet? Are you spending time in the Word? Are you cultivating that relationship with Him? Because God has called us into relationship with Him. That's what Jesus did. He came to seek and save that which was lost. He came to reconcile us back to Him, back to God, because we had broken the relationship. The relationship was broken. Jesus came to restore that relationship. And that's what we are doing. We are acting as ambassadors, as mediators, not that we are, we are the one mediating ultimately between us and God, but we are bringing a lost sinner and, 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 and showing them where they can get bread. It's through Christ. Where they can be reconciled to God through his son, Jesus. And that's, that's about as simple as it gets. You know, people say, well, I don't know how. It's like, okay, well, you know how, you, how God saved you. You came by way of the cross. You know, there was some semblance of repentance. I mean, there was, there was, there was an attitude where you said, I, you know, I knew I, be, I was a sinner. I mean, that was kind of the pivot point for me. I mean, Scripture, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I knew that my sin merited punishment. When I started reading Scripture, realizing it's hell, the wages of sin is death. I realize now that, that, that the gift of God, the free gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I knew that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He rose again from the dead. And Jesus was asking me to turn from my sin and turn in faith to him. And that's about as simple as it gets. Jesus, who was fully God, the Son of God, he died. He, I like to put it this way. When I wrap up a conversation, I tell people, I broke the law. We broke the law. Jesus paid our fine. Are you willing to turn from your sin? And are you willing to turn and follow Jesus? Put your faith, total faith and trust in what he has done for you. I know that's kind of a, a simplistic way, but this is a, I like to try to summarize the conversations when I get done. I'm not a big Franklin Graham fan here, so I, I'm not, I don't want to offend or not, but Franklin Graham did say something that I thought was very key. He said, and I'm going to marry it up with something that my own pastor said. Evangelism is not feeding the homeless. Evangelism is not digging a well. Evangelism is not counseling. Preaching the gospel to somebody is telling them verbally about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ, who is the sinless Son of God, had to use words, why do we think that we do not have to use words? Many times Christians will say, well, I just let my light shine. I just let, you know, I just let people see Jesus in me. That's good. I mean, I, we should live sanctified, holy lives. That gives strength to the gospel message that we're bringing to that person. Because let me tell you something. You know that many people in the world, the last thing they want to do is hear the gospel message from somebody who's just, not living for Christ. I'll just put it that way. You know what I'm saying? They're living like a hypocrite. Proverbs 28.1 says, the righteous are as bold as a lion. We are not righteous in and of ourselves, but we are righteous in Christ because of his righteousness. And because we are his ambassadors, because we go out with his authority, we can go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I want to just share a few stories and kind of encapsulate all this because I know a lot of times people love to hear evangelistic stories. 
I remember one time I was going into a Kinko's and I was tired. Uh, I, did, I just wanted to get in and I wanted to get out. I did not want to talk to anybody. And so I went to make my copies, and this is, this is years ago. So this is like right in the interim where they have a kiosk where you can get your receipt after you put your credit card into the, into the printer. And when I went in the door, and I don't feel like the Lord like really makes things very clear to me as far as speaking to somebody, but I felt like the Lord wanted me to speak to the guy behind the counter. I said no. I went to, my, I went to the printer. I was, I was tired. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I made my, my copies. I was, the Lord was already convicting me. It's like, I felt like he really clearly told me what to do. I repented there at the printer. And I said, Lord, I said, I don't know. This is really going to be awkward for me to go up and, and start talking to this guy now. And I, I said, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to make that right. So I'm sorry. So I went to get my credit card back out. I, I put it in the kiosk, about to go out you know, to get, get my paper, paper receipt, not my email receipt. And as I was getting the receipt, the guy behind the counter, and by the way, my name is John Jacob. You're going, yeah, you were told that. Your name is John Jacob. So how many of you know the song John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt? Raise your hand if you know that song. Okay. So anyway, if you don't know that song, there's a song called John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt. Well, the guy behind the counter, who is an unbeliever, starts singing John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt. Just randomly. You're thinking you're on camera or something, you know. I'm thinking, well, I know that no, I mean, nobody else knew this because I'm carrying on the conversation in my mind. I'm thinking, okay, Lord, wow. So I went ahead and I went back up to him. I shared a gospel track with him. There was two or three other girls behind the counter. They created an opportunity for me able to share with him. I just laid out to him exactly what happened. You know, that I didn't want to talk to him, that I didn't want to share the gospel. I was just, I was in my zone. I was tired. I didn't want to talk to anybody. There are many, many opportunities around us. I'm going to use, I'm going to give you two more stories. My neighbor had a professional grass cutter come in and, and was cutting their grass. And so she was lingering out in the yard. I went out and I carry gospel tracks, by the way. For me, that's a comfortable way. And find your own niche. I mean, find your own, what's, what your comfort zone is as to how to open up a conversation. If you want to know more about that, we can talk about that afterwards here. I'm not going to bring that up in, in the middle of the sermon here. But I use these little million-dollar bills to open up conversations. I have opened up probably thousands, tens of thousands of conversations with these. And I just use these as what I call an, an, an icebreaker to break the ice, to open up the conversation, and then from there I can open up the, you know, to share the gospel. Well, I went up to this lady, and I, I said, hey, how you doing? Fine. Hey, did you get one of these? She took it. She goes, she looked at it. She goes, just really mean. She goes, do you think anybody gets saved reading gospel tracts? And oh Lord, help me! This, this, this. I, I've got. This is just not going to go well. So she, she goes. She, she answered her own question. She goes, "Well, I'm one of them." She was saved, but she was saying she had she had gotten saved through the reading of a gospel tract. And there are many more great men and women of history who have been saved through the reading of a gospel tract. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China was one. And I'll wrap it up with this last story. And I'm going to interject this. My wife and I, we try to make the most of every opportunity. We make the most of every opportunity. The scripture says to make the most of every opportunity. There are opportunities all around us. My wife was at the BMV. She was in long line. Wow. I joined her. I had gotten the opportunity to share the gospel before I had come to, be, to the BMV with somebody else. 
my wife and I, we tag team when we're out sharing the gospel. I mean, I could start one sentence, she could finish it. We are so affluent and know and, and can pass off between another one another and know where the conversation is going when we're talking to somebody, what their struggles are, what's going on. So anyway, my point being that I came in, started talking to her. I started sharing the story of how I had just got done sharing the gospel with this other person. I didn't say, hey, honey, I got to share the gospel with somebody. I said, I got to share the gospel with somebody. And then I walked through the detail of the conversation, word for word, of what the conversation was. Not for her benefit, but for the benefit of the people in line so that they could hear the gospel. And as I proceeded to continue to share the gospel, to share the story. We were thinking one person was listening and, you know, and the other people were just kind of ignoring us. And uh, we thought one gentleman next behind us was really focusing in. And, and then all of a sudden this lady in front of us, she goes, you need to come to my house and share what you're talking about here with my family. Total stranger. Uh, we, we lingered around afterwards. She finished up. We finished up. We went to their house. Long story. Her whole, she gathered her whole family there in her household. And we sat down for about an hour sharing the gospel. One of the ladies had just lost her boyfriend, fiance, uh, from a drug overdose. Rough, rough situation. Um, a lot of stuff. But all, all I want to encourage you with is this. There are opportunities all around us. Get equipped. If you're not equipped, go through some evangel. I, I went through the Way of the Master program by Ray Comfort. Love that program. That's, to me, I, I find, I, I, I personally, my personal opinion, I don't think there's any better program. If you have some other program that you like, use it. Load tools in your evangelistic tool belt. Cultivate your relationship with Jesus Christ. I love my wife. I'll talk about my wife because I love her. If we really love Jesus Christ, will we not speak of him to other people? God says we're to love him supremely. He's to be first. And secondly, we're to love our neighbor. The atheist uh, I'm hoping I'm going to wrap it up here. You know, pastors, pastors or preachers say they got this last story, the last, last one. So I'm, this, la, this hopefully it will be the last. So Atheist Pendulette, he gives a little three-minute uh, video where he's outside of one of his um, performances. And he had just got done pre, uh, doing his comedy routine. And there was a, belie- a, a Christian who had come up, give him a Bible, and I think he had shared the gospel with him. Penn Gillette didn't slam the guy. He did a video to actually say how much he appreciated this Christian giving him a Bible and sharing the gospel with him. He didn't agree with him, but he appreciated it. He said, and he kept on saying over and over, he was really nice. He was really nice. He, 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 and he wasn't saying it just so much from his demeanor. You mean meaning the Christian who had shared the gospel? He was, he was saying he was really nice, meaning he had stepped out of his comfort zone to share the gospel with him. And Pendulette said something very telling. He said, he, essentially, he said, "You Christians," he said, you, "you you say that there's this place, eternal place called heaven, where you can have eternal joy and bliss and spend it with in, in eternity with God, and that there's this horrible, horrible place called hell." And essentially, he said, you guys preach like neither exist. He said, because you don't, you don't tell people about how to get there. And he goes, and you don't warn people about how not to go to hell. In other words, you don't, warn, you, don't, you don't tell people about the good news about basically how to get to heaven. And I'm paraphrasing things that he said. I'm condensing the conversation down. But he said, and you don't warn people of how to avoid hell. He goes, how much do you have to hate somebody, to know that eternal life is attainable, to not tell them, and how much do you have to hate them to know that there's an eternal hell waiting for them, and you don't warn them? 
Brothers and sisters, I'm just encouraging you. There are opportunities all around you. I guarantee you, before this day is up, you have multiple opportunities every single day to share the gospel. Not once or twice a week, every day where you go. I know it because there's nothing special about my wife and I. There's not. We are just jars of clay, just like you. We are dust. And God has breathed his life into us. He's given you that same life, his Holy Spirit life, to embolden and strengthen you to do the same thing that we we do. And I'm not trying to presume because I, from the sounds that you were already doing this evangelistic trip, I, I would presume that there are people in this congregation that are already sharing the gospel on a regular basis. I'm looking at it, and I know there are people in this congregation that do. But maybe those of that you that don't, hopefully this is an encouragement to you. It's not meant, I'm not, I'm not trying to send a stinging rebuke, but I am saying, again, the righteous are as bold as the lion. Jesus said to go in to all the world to preach the gospel to every creature. And as long as we're on this side of heaven, that is our privilege and it is our responsibility. I don't have any zinger on the last end. I'm, I'm, that's it. Thank you. Let me give a John Jacobs story real quick. So this has been a month ago. We're out evangelizing downtown Indy. You know, people talk about the friendship evangelism. How you friend with someone for five or six years where you see them the gospel. Uh, it's called friendship evangelism in five seconds. That's all it takes for him to do that. And I just sat back and watched him do that in five seconds. It's really, really cool. Uh, so, brother, thank you again. Thank you, brother. Uh, I just want to provide some exhortation now for sure. Follow up with you. Uh, John Jacob, as you know, is running to be. Uh, running for office to be a minister. I want to say that. He's going to be a minister in a different sphere of authority, but the civil sphere. I know you guys have heard the statement before, right? Well, when we vote for a president, we're not voting for a pastor. You hear those sort of statements. Well, I understand that. It's a sense. The church, a civil magistrate is called a minister of God, a servant of God. Listen to Romans 13.6. The authorities are ministers of God. Which means this, in politics, which of course is a dirty little word to say in church, there's no neutrality. Zero. Neutrality is a myth. And so a worldview is going to be put forward in all the laws that are going to come out in the next session. And primarily, what are we seeing today? The worldview of humanism. It's an an abandonment of God's law. So a God-honoring magistrate is someone who knows the word of God as the foundation of truth, and of morals, and of good, and of goodness. So, I was uh, reminded, I was reading Deuteronomy 17, I was pointed to it from a book I was reading uh, this week, that every king in Israel, this is amazing, every king in Israel, what they were commanded to do was to take and write a copy of God's law. So when they got it, when they sat on the throne, they had to write a copy of God's law, For the purpose of this, it says, It shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law in these statutes and the doing of them. That's what a minister was to do, a king, to keep the law of God. So he wrote it down so that they knew that this was God's law they were to uphold. Uh, Brother John Jacob, this is my exhortation to you because David had a name and a prophet. My exhortation to you is, you are to minister God's law. God's law. You don't make humanistic law. It's God's law as a minister in the state house. Amen. Brother John Jacob, by God's grace, is that type of civil magistrate. He is. He's a godly man. He's someone that we should be supporting. I've known John for about two years. He's very faithful. He's a hum- humble minister of the gospel, of course, all by God's grace. So I want to plead with you a little bit here. And that as Christians, we don't often give to things that we should be giving towards. Caesar's going to take 30 to 40% of your checks this, this year. The church gives well under, well
well under that. If we believe in something, we need to stand behind it. And I even mean that financially. So if you guys, of course, can see where his website is, you have a bulletin. He did not ask me to do this, but I believe it's something that we should be standing for. Um, I don't know if Brian mentioned this, but yeah, it's historic. John Jacob is the very first abolitionist candidate to ever be an incumbent, an incumbent in the history of America. I mean, it's incredible. Can we throw one more stat for you? Sorry, just a little while ago. But you know what percent of people you need to abolish abortion? I'll give you a historical fact. 3% of people is all they needed to abolish slavery. It's 3%. That's the number. I reached out to Russell Hunter. He confirmed that point. We need 3% of this nation to abolish abortion. This shows how weak and feeble a bunch of those in John Jacob is he's standing up on that. So let's continue to keep him in our prayers. Brother, thank you again. Of course, man. Thank you, brother. Jesus Christ, keep us in prayer. Amen. You guys stand up with me. We'll close with the doxology. Praise God, God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Our benediction is 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now before you dismiss, Gosh, Jen, I know you're just busy, but would you pray a blessing over our students before you go down to your business with them? Yes. Yes. Thank God. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Amen. Could you hear me? Yeah. Was, 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 was everything I said?